trees. It's going to parse the puzzle input, build the trees, and then once it's done, it'll calculate the slopes. And you'll see the trees that are red are where the, the seven slopes are. It's so cool. <laughs> Programming, gaming, fitness. Jesse Warden. What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here. I am so excited to show you. I finally got my Evanico Day 3 tree generator working finally i had to use a much much smaller puzzle input but for it works and it actually visually generates and shows you know the, the actual stuff so to give you context day three puzzle input two is the same as kind of day one where you have a bunch of trees at random positions from your puzzle input and you've got to have a slope and they want to know how many trees that you hit based on those slopes. And what I wanted to do was visualize those that path and those trees that you hit. So I, I generate the trees and then I mark the green tree. I had to make it small because you, you can't see from overhead and I don't have the admin controls to fly yet. My daughter gave me one, but it's not quite working. So anyway, point is I need to make it smaller so I can stand over the trees and see it, but it'll mark the trees red for the ones that are actually in the slope line. And some of the challenges that I had were, if you look at the puzzle input for this, let me show you the code real quick. On day three's puzzle input, it's just massive, right? You have to take this and then duplicate it to the right a few times. So when you have a, a, a downward slope that goes like right, that it has enough room to hit the bottom. So if you have a very large set of column slope where you're going right a few times, you know, the angle in which you go down right is far, which means that this puzzle input needs to be duplicated, which means your arrays and lists are just gigantic. And so you have an exponentially large amount of trees, like 20,000 or whatever it is. So I just have a, a much smaller puzzle input and I only duplicated, I think twice to the right. So I only have, you know, a hundred or so trees. And what that allows is I can actually draw it without crashing my, my game on my low powered Mac. So watch, watch this. I'm gonna go build trees. It's gonna parse the puzzle input build the trees, and then once it's done, it'll calculate the slopes, and you'll see the trees that are red are where the, the seven slopes are. And it, you know, there's about, I think, five slopes, but the some of them don't hit, you know, different trees. They Some of them hit the same trees. So you can see from the top left, it goes down right. So originally, I tried to make this way out there, <laughs> and the puzzle input was too big. So I just run it with a smaller input on when I build trees. These are still using the main puzzle input from advent of code this one's just using a bit smaller so you can see that's why it's only hitting two trees so if i run the original and then run it you can see it's it's got to parse everything and calculate the hits it takes a much longer even with the coroutines and has you know a total of a couple a couple hundred trees that it hit with a larger final product but anyway i was just super excited that i could not only build the trees not only that but then i learned how to clear it so like if you look at this workspace here i create the trees in the forest floor but then I put the parent of there. So each one of these trees has a parent of this platform they're sitting on, the forest floor. And I just give them rows and columns of numbers so I can individually target a tree very quickly as you know, kind of like a lookup table, right? But if I want to delete it, I just destroy the forest floor and it gets rid of all the geometry that I created. And I'm assuming is garbage collected. So pretty cool. So I, anyway, I'm just so excited. It took me so long, way too long <laughs> to get that to work. Showing these algorithms on a text screen is one thing, but actually being able to visualize, you know, the data is just so cool. Walk you through the code. I just have a different method to get a smaller input. And I duplicated all puzzle two because I wanted to muck around with how you create things and slow some things down differently. So let me start from the main. I want to show you how we kind of run this down. So we parse the smaller input, although it's the parse method, it parses the smaller input and makes the rows and columns as before. It's just a lot smaller. So the multidimensional array, arrays within arrays is a lot smaller. And then once I get the wall, I get the position. And because everything in Roblox is centered in geometry, you got to do all this horrible math to offset it, which is just reminds me of the flash days where you would always align objects to the top left. So it was zero, zero instead of the X and Y being in the center. I'm sure there's a way in Roblox parts to do that, but I'm still learning their 3D geometry and API. So I generate the force floor, which is just a part at this particular size, but each one, is a size of measurement in Robux is called a stud. And so each stud is the same size of the array. So if the array is 20,000 items wide, then it'll be 20,000 studs wide. And the stud actually isn't that big. It's about the half the size of like your, your sneaker, I guess. 
as a character. But the size of these arrays with the puzzle input were just gigantic. So way too much geometry. So I just shrunk it really far down. Once you have the forest floor as a name, then you can target that in the workspace. You can go like workspace dot forest floor. And just like every one of these things is an object model that you can target in real time with no latency. So it, when I dynamically create geometry, I don't have to wait for it like you do with players that join games. So once I have the forest floor, I can then make the trees and all the trees are is just a simple for loop inside of a for loop, you know, doing the multidimensional array of the rows and index. The key here, though, is I only make a tree if the item's a tree. If it's like an empty slot, you know, the dot and the input, like this stuff, the dots, then you're not going to create a tree, right? And the starting position is where the top left of that force for it is. And then you just add a vector each time, which is, you know, increases based on the column index and row index. So this for loop kind of handles the offset for you. And again, since we're dealing with studs, each number or integer is basically one, two, three, four, five studs, right? In terms of position. I do a weight of zero just so the coroutine doesn't lock up the game with lots of trees and you can kind of see it build while you're playing and moving around. So it gives, you know, the word loops time for it to draw. So your code isn't like consuming all the CPU. Um, I did it for rows when I had larger stuff, but now that it's like so fast, I can just wait per tree. It's pretty fast. And so that'll make the, the trees inside of the parent part, right? The make trees parents part. So that way they'll be inside of, in terms of a parent relationship into that one piece of geometry. And then I can just nuke that geometry later to, you know, start over if I want. So one point about the make tree is that I have a lookup table for it. So although it creates inside the tree small, it's hard coded, the trees themselves are dynamically named to have rows and columns. So you just put an underscore in tree. You can put dashes too, but I had a bug. I was paranoid. Uh, but anyway, you can put the, the names of their rows and columns. So that way, if you ever need to get a particular tree of like row five, column six, you just put it into the name and then you can dynamically create that name as a lookup table when you uh, need to get a particular tree. And that way, when I'm trying to figure out all the trees hits, then I get all the hit locations from the trees hit. So the tree hit usually is just looking at about what trees are hit. But I also keep, by the way, we have a tree hit at this particular column and index. So later on when I want to draw, I have these cached and ready to go. And then I can use those to iterate through that big list of trees and say, all right, this location has a hit. Is there a tree at this particular location? And obviously there is because I wouldn't have written, you know, a hit location unless there was a tree. So it's same data. Um, no worries there, but this hit location is, is just a, a big array of those things. So when we loop through the trees, we're going to map just cause it's easier to map cause I don't care about for loops at this point anymore. It's just a big linear array. We're going to get the tree at that particular location of the row and column. Then we're going to change its color to red and they have this really cool pop-up. You can like change the color bar, but anyway, we change the color to red and then I wait a second, just like I do before, so you can kind of see it in real time without, you know, blocking the for loop. Because you, you want to see it up here, right? You don't want to see it, like, like immediately turn red. It's kind of neat to watch it build in real time. Um, so once you color the trees, you're good. Like, it's, it calculates all four of the slopes. So this is the puzzle input for uh, day two, or I'm sorry, day three puzzle input two. And it has all the slopes. And so I just use the hit locations from each one to color the trees again and again. And so if it's already red, that's fine. Um, but it, it handles every single one of those. So that's why there's multiple lines of those trees. And that's it. So I just was really excited. I finally got to see this working. And I removed the slow because now I'm just, I like how you can run an algorithm, see it run, and then go do other things, right? It's an asynchronous kind of, kind of way. Um, I think the one problem I found out is there are just... This style of coding has, even with promises that I borrowed from JavaScript, has so many race conditions. It's unbelie <laughs> unbelievable how much stuff can go wrong here. Even they really should have like maybes and errors and alerts. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's that's what I want to show. I'm really excited about it, and uh, I'll post the code in the comments later.